Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, my name is Susan Bookbinder. I'm delighted to be your host uh, for this very important session, bringing it all together, ending FGM through strong and effecti effective national action. I am particularly glad to be here today because uh, as a journalist, I've been trying to get this issue on the media agenda for about 10 years until as recently as last year, this time last year, my attempts to get FGM on the agenda would be greeted by embarrassment at best, or horror, disgust, and now suddenly it's a ratings winner. We're all talking about it, and for me it was particularly inspiring to hear our Home Secretary announcing a raft of measures to really put our country in a leadership position on taking this issue on. However, we accept that we do have a lot to learn, and we can learn a lot from our colleagues in Europe, we're represented here by Portugal, who have done some amazing work, and from Africa, represented by Kenya, Burkina Faso, and we have our own minister here, Norman Baker, and we also have Wales represented as well in Janet Shashati. So we're going to hear from all over the world and also from the Inter-Africa Committee. Because we are in the middle of a revolution. We're going to do this in a revolutionary way, in that we want to get to your questions as soon as possible to make sure this is an interactive discussion so that we can exchange ideas and learn from each other. Uh, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna have a brief introduction from America, an overarching introduction of what we hope uh, to achieve in the next hour. Um, and then we, we are going to, I'm gonna put a question to each one of our assembled illustrious panel, and they're going to answer within five minutes. And Britain, you have to carve up your five minutes into two and a half, I'm afraid, because it's two for the price of one. And then we're gonna throw the floor to your questions. Um, so, first of all, I'd like to, I'm delighted to introduce you uh, to Kathy Russell, who is the US Ambassador at Large for Global Women's Issues. And she's going to take us through what we hope uh, to achieve in the next few mo moments. Kathy. Great. Thank you, Susan. Can you hear me? Is that working? Yes. Thank you, Susan, very much for that very kind introduction. And thank you so much to the United Kingdom for convening this incredibly important summit. Um, by now, we all know the horrifying statistics. 120 to 140 million women and girls around the world have undergone FGMC, and another 3 million girls are at risk every year, including American girls, which is not something that we typically hear about, at least not very much in the United States. As U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry recently said, these statistics are a challenge to the decency of every single one of us. That's why I'm so glad to be here today to welcome our fellow speakers, and so thank you so much for that opportunity. I also wanted to take just a minute or two to talk about the United States government commitment to addressing this issue. Internationally, the United States addresses FGMC through diplomacy, policy, and programming. Through our U.S. strategy to prevent and respond to gender-based violence, the United States recognizes FGMC as a harmful practice and as a form of gender-based violence that requires a comprehensive response. In 2012, we began to strengthen our reporting of this practice in our annual Human Rights Report. And through the Department of State and USAID, we invest in community-based approaches to address both the causes and consequences of FGMC. For example, we will soon begin working in partnership with the government of Guinea and other multilateral and civil society actors to eliminate FGMC in many parts of that country. We're also helping to fund the Center for Excellence at Nairobi University, which seeks to improve health care and promote education on the FG FGMC subject. Domestically, FGMC has been illegal in the United States since 1996. A 2013 law also made it illegal for families to send their children abroad to undergo the practice. The U.S. Department of Health and Human Services supports programs in various U.S. communities for at-risk girls that provide training for medical providers, community health education, and education on sexual violence and direct services. In addition, our Centers for Disease Control and Prevention is producing a new report on the number of girls at risk. We really don't have current data on, on uh, status in the United States and have already on, who have already undergone FGMC in the United States, which will help us drive better responses. Everyone in this room today understands the need for a comprehensive approach to eliminating FGMC, one that includes community-led responses, change in social norms, and political commitment. Today, the United States reaffirms our commitment to abolishing this practice. It is a challenge, one we're ready to accept and overcome together. So thank you very much. We really look forward to the conversation, and we look forward to working together going forward.
Thank you very much indeed, Cathy, for that. Uh, now let's go to Africa, starting in Kenya, where amazing things have happened, fantastic progress. We really do congratulate you. So let's hear about it from the Honorable Dr. Lima Jebil Kalimo, who is chair of Kenya's anti-FGM board established in December last year. Over to you. Thank you very much. Uh I want to address the issue of how Kenya came up uh, with the prohibition of female genital mutilation uh, law. It, is, it was a multi-sexual approach, and many people worked on it. An example will be that the former leaders, the former presidents that we had, Jomo Kenyatta, the late Jomo Kenyatta and uh, President uh, Moi, we have what you call side uh, uh, pronunciations or proclamations. They just said female genital mutilation is not good. The, the, the religious people uh, who came to Kenya to preach Christianity first also spoke against female genital mutilation. So we have the leaders and we have the faith-based organizations or the re religious people. Then we have sheikhs, Muslims, who have also studied the Quran and came up with the conclusion that female genital mutilation is not in the Quran. Uh, the, third group of, the third group of people are the non-governmental organizations, civil society organizations. This, I must commend them for the great work they did sensitizing communities on the dangers of female genital mutilation. However, many communities would shut off and say that is, those are NGOs. Uh, then we had to take it to parliament. And for it to have succeeded, because we need champions. I was one of those champions who from my childhood at the age of nine, when I was to be subjected to FGM, I refused because of education. My reason was I will drop out, out of school. So the Kenya government uh, in 2001, following the pronunciations of leaders and the work that had been done by NGOs, and it is important because they, NGOs, they network with government. A government cannot just do it alone. So from the reports that NGOs have been doing, what was put in uh, was the Children's Act 2001, once they realized the dangers of FGM on education. So when the law came on, on prohibition of FGM, it was not punitive enough. It was just up to the age of 18. Then it was discovered again, and thanks to the work that civil societies do, and a listening government, I must comment my government that it listens to, to research when they get and they, they take action on it. Uh, then we had the prohibition of female genital mutilation act. All this together needed to be passed on the floor of the house. So members of parliament, thank God I was in parliament that time and I have been campaigning against uh, uh, female genital mutilation, supported with, by other members of parliament and the donor community and implementing partners. If UNFPA and UNICEF here, yeah, I want to thank them. They took us for workshop, but of course, as they take us to workshops, government itself was also facilitating. And so we came up with the act. In conclusion, because I want to leave my time for questions from you, was that female, is female genital mutilation cannot be done by one person or one actor. It has to be done by many actors. The professionals from the communities who practice female genital mutilation realized that the ground was not level when it came to job uh, placement as that because they were very few women from their communities who were educated. The burden of reliance on the few working class who managed to get employment was too much. And some of them went back to their communities to say, I think there is something wrong over here. Female genital mutilation is pulling us backward instead of forward of as much as development is concerned. Thank you. Thank you very much for that account from the listening government of Kenya. Thank you very much for that. Now let's move to Burkina Faso, which has made, again, fantastic progress uh, on FGM. And we're delighted to welcome to update us on how that's been done by Dr. Alan P. Zubga. He's the Minister for Social Action and National Solidarity in Burkina Faso. And that is the ministry that's in charge of the fight against FGM in the country. And the question that I have for you, Minister, is, can you explain which stakeholders have been the most important in all your achievements, which we do congratulate you on? 
And oh, just to say, you'll need your headphones unless you speak fluent French, because the minister is going to address us in French. Thank you, and uh, I would like to uh, greet you all and uh, thank all the uh, stakeholders who have organized this conference. It's a great thing that you were able to bring us together, some of us representing states, some of them, some of us uh, NGOs. Now, we have, I think, quite remarkable results, but that isn't really um, the, the point of, uh, of this uh, afternoon session. Perhaps what is important is how we got where we are. Stakeholders had a level of commitment which was certainly political. The state itself, the, our first lady, as you know, uh, she really took the ball by the horns and worked and worked at it in at the at national level, in a, in Africa and and the world over. And that is how we eventually, uh, through her initiative, uh, we got the United Nations. Uh, revolution, resolution, which we all know, and therefore had a vanguard uh, action. There's no doubt about it in this area because of this. Could I, could I add that not only did we have a good leader, but we also worked hand in hand with uh, neighboring countries, Mali, uh, Côte d'Ivoire, Niger. We've got agreement with the Ivory Coast because um, there are uh, movements across the border, which mean that we have to cooperate or else we can't do it. So that has been one level. The other one has been that we have made sure that we brought in all the sectors. Those who uh, may or can have an influence on what happens, not only the state, but technical and financial partners, funding partners, it is important that all be involved at national level, of course. And this was done through uh, a very strong advocacy. And that is why we emphasized the fact that this has to be a pluri, uh, multi-sectorial. For instance, we've got the National Council, where all, pretty well all stakeholders are members. And together, we uh, decided that there would be a networks that would be set up uh, within the various regions and the provinces, and this is being done. There has also been a legal uh, commitment. We've got a constitution which uh, should, which aims at uh, eliminating this sort of practices. The constitution says so, uh, and it's certainly no great uh, uh, reflection on our country that there are men and women who work against this in our country, which is why we made sure that our code of 1989 uh, on the family we made sure it had uh, provisions which make these practices illegal. So we've got this law, this act, this 1986, which uh, enforces this rule and uh, punishes not only those who do it, but those who are accomplices. So these were uh, urgent and, and strong measures that we took. And lastly, we have to remember that there are two major challenges. Other border movement, cross-border movements. So if our neighbors do not ban it, some people go across the border to, to do it. And this is where perhaps we could get somewhere together since we are gathered here. Beg your pardon, it's too much technology for me to cope with, the, uh, headphones, etc. So the, what I took mostly from uh, the minister from Burkina Faso's um, very interesting insight there into how successful they've been is it's about cooperation with neighboring countries, uh, which takes us nicely uh, back home uh, to England and Wales, uh, starting with Norman Baker, who of course is the lead minister for the coalition government's domestic policy on FGM. Now, um, Minister, great to see you again. Um, what does the joined up approach mean to you? Um, thank you, Susan, and I concur with your initial observation that we've made tremendous progress in the last 12 months, which is really encouraging. And it's great to see so many colleagues from different parts of the world here today, and thank, I thank them for coming along to this particular event. We've made great progress, I think, because we've managed to join up the dots. Uh, we've joined up the dots both in government we have, for example, initiated a cross-departmental declaration, so it's not simply my department which deals with uh, FGM, 
or forced marriage. It is also other departments too. So we have involved the Department for Health, we have involved the Department for Education, we have involved the local government department. Um, so all the, and we have linked it, of course, with the Foreign Office and with the development for international, Department for International Development. So by working together and signing a, a cross-departmental declaration, we got the whole of the government pulling in the same direction, which is epitomised today, of course, by the Prime Minister making his speech and indeed by the actions of the Deputy Prime Minister, uh, who will also be here today and uh, announce some measures at the weekend. But it's not simply <coughs> enough for us to work across government together. We have to work with partners elsewhere. Uh, we would be fooling ourselves if we thought government has all the answers. We don't have all the answers. So we have to work, for example, with the frontline professionals. We have to make sure that our doctors, our nurses, uh, our teachers, our social workers are fully signed up to this campaign to try to eradicate FGM. We're, we're clearly very grateful for their support, but we are going to go further and make it mandatory for uh, reporting to now occur. That's one of the announcements today, to make sure that it is taken seriously wherever uh, you happen to be. We're also working, of course, with the voluntary sector heavily because uh, there are many uh, people, um, girls in particular, who may not feel comfortable going to the government or going to uh, an official in local government or going to the police, but they may feel comfortable talking to people that they know and trust any voluntary sector organisation. So it's absolutely important that we work together with the voluntary sector, and indeed we are doing so. And part of what I've done has been to allocate 300,000 euros uh, across uh, various uh, voluntary sector bodies to help the national communications campaign to uh, aimed at particular communities where FGM occurs, to raise awareness with e-learning with its local safeguarding children's boards, and to give money out to local voluntary organisations who can help spread the message. Um, and we've had a very useful lunch just now with uh, colleagues in the voluntary sector. And I'm quite clear, if we're going to deal with this, we have to pull together. One last group of people we have to pull together with is the media. Because, uh, again, I'm very grateful for some of the, some of the British press, uh, the Evening Standard in particular, but also The Guardian and The Times, who have been really helpful on this and have managed to get this message about FGM out to people who, 12 months ago, had never heard of it. And when people hear of it, they want to campaign with us to end it. So I'm really pleased we're making progress. And of course, we work with our colleagues in the Welsh Assembly. <laughs> Thank you very much, Minister. So yes, we're delighted to hear uh, from Wales in the form of the delightful Janet Shashati, who is the anti-slavery officer for the Welsh Government. And you've been doing some fantastic work too. Um, yes, uh, I'm the anti-slavery officer for Welsh Government, but more importantly, I lead Welsh Government's agenda on female genital mutilation, honour-based violence and forced marriages. In the past two years, Welsh Government has made huge strides in trying to tackle this, and one of the main uh, components of this was raising awareness. To us, raising awareness is definitely through training. Um, as you are aware, Welsh Government has some devolved powers. Education and health is devolved matters in Wales. So these are the kind of channels at which we were trying to kind of push awareness of FGM through. Um, so we are working collaboratively to promote awareness and prevention of FGM through training. Key organisations and individuals um, in public services including health, police, education and the voluntary sector using publicity, social media and campaigns. Um, the Welsh Government uh, recently has published its um, gender-based violence, domestic abuse and sexual violence bill, which we are very proud to announce that includes FGM, honour-based violence and forced marriages as its component in the bill. Uh, one of the proposals of the bill is to have a national training framework um, for Wales on violence against women, domestic abuse and sexual violence, which will include FGM and honour-based violence and forced marriages. And this aims to consolidate a variety of training programmes into a single centrally managed resource. Um, the framework is being mapped out to proposed audiences and will promote proportionate and relevant training depending on the audience need. So that means whether you're a teacher, a social worker, a doctor, you will be able to have this training component um, as part of your training and being part of the organisation. Um, specifically, the National Training Framework includes a level aimed at public service leaders in order to offer clarity and support in implementing the forthcoming legislation and support their workforce as well 
for the same purpose. So we are very clear that, as has been mentioned before, it's not just up to government, but it's up to everyone to be able to do this. Another great stride in Welsh Government has been the Health Relationship Schools Programme, which is being um, piloted from September this year, and hopefully we'll be able to roll it out nationally across Wales um, from September 2015. This will ensure that um, healthy relationships are taught in all schools in Wales, including FGM, honour-based violence and forced marriages as its component. Um, so since we're trying to kind of give the U UK national picture, I'd stop there. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Fantastic. OK, we'll stay in Europe before we go back to Africa, because uh, we have a lot to learn from Portugal, um, who is represented here in the form of Vita Almeida from the Portuguese government. Um, now, Portugal in 2013 were held up as a, a shining icon, an example by the European Institute for Gender Equality, describing what you've done as an example of good practice. So, Victor, we, we'd like to know what to do. Uh, I'm not fluent in English, so I need to read my notes, and I hope that you all understand. Um, the intersectoral group on FGM in Portugal was, in fact, considered a good practice by the European Institute for Gender Equality. And how did we make it? I will resume it in four uh, main points. Partnership, health approach, advocacy, and the involvement of the practicing communities. Partnership. I must say that, like the title of this session, we are bringing all together. The first program of action uh, in 2009 was already implemented uh, by representatives of civil world bodies, public entities from almost all uh, ministries, international organizations, and NGOs. All of those partners remain in the group, which is mostly composed by the same people. I think this is an important point and brings to the group maturity, unity, and continuous learning. The European Institute recognizes that uh, the effectiveness of the actions taken are largely due to the multidisciplinary and multi-skilled group. Furthermore, the group is composed by the most appropriate organizations for the implementation of the program measures and reflects all the dimensions by which FGM should be addressed. And the coexistence of such different organizations should be highlighted, because typically it's not easy to put public administration bodies working with NGOs, for example, at least in Portugal. Health approach. We know that the health approach is the one more effective. So the health ministry is deeply involved at both political and professional levels. As a result of that, a many important instrument was produced by le last year, a guideline about FGM for health professionals. Another important activity carried out was a post-graduation on FGM, addressed to the health professionals who pursue their professional activity in health facilities located in geographic areas of greatest risk. Those professionals became local focal points in those areas working with some local stakeholders, like local commissions for protection of children's rights, NGOs, immigrant associations, teachers, and so on. Advocacy. I must say that the national program appears in Portugal as a result of an advocacy project promoted by a fiery NGO. This NGO played a very important role in all the process by influencing and lobbying politicians as well as some key governmental bodies. FGM became definitely in Portugal an issue of the public agenda, which also enriches the political debate. The intersectoral group meets every two months, chaired by the Secretary of State for Parliamentary Affairs and Equality herself. This gives more dynamism to the working group and it's definitely a mark of interest at governmental level. Uh, finally, involvement of the pesticizing community. The European Institute also underlines the very active involvement of pesticizing communities in the development and implementation of policies. 
During the first program, the link with communities was mainly maintained through the NGOs present in the group. But recently, several initiatives have been taken to involve them directly, some of them at high level. So three immigrant associations recently joined the group. We want them as a formal partners. Aiming to involve the associations in a more active way, it was created a prize. Prize against FGM, change the future now. This award supports them to develop prevention projects in the communities at risk, especially those that are very effect effective and influential in their communities, but with no resources to apply for national and European funds. Finally, I must say that the second program of action for the elimination of FGM ended in the last December with 96.6% of its measures and activities implemented, which is very gratifying. Thank you. Thank you, Vito. Now, um, let's go back to Africa. Um, because we have the great benefit of 30 years of experience in fighting FGM, and that comes in the form of the Inter-African Committee on Traditional Practices, and we are delighted to represent, uh, to represent them. We're delighted to welcome the Executive Director, Dr. Morisanda Koyeti. Now, my question to you is, 30 years of experience, what lessons have you learned about the successful approaches to end FGM in Africa? Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like, uh, on behalf of the 29 member countries of uh, Inter-African Committee, which is represented here by our president, Madam Mariam Lamizana, she's in the room. In this room, I would like to thank uh, the government of UK and uh, also to bring the greetings from Africa. Uh, during its uh, 30 years of existence, the IEC Inter-African Committee has developed important experience and expertise in the elimination of harmful traditional practices in general and child marriage and female genital mutilation in particular. The 29 member countries of IEC, although they belong to the same organization, our organization, they are implementing the same program, but they are not at the same level. This is very important to be analyzed. The second thing is that although FGM and child marriage are mainly prevalent in Africa, the reality against uh, within the African diaspora throughout the world shows us that the fight must be global. And the third lesson, which is very important, is that there is no one-size-fits-all solution tested and approved. No, there is no one solution. Based on these three findings, uh, we need to recall the specific situation uh, in some countries in Africa. For example, when you take Burkina Faso, why Burkina Faso is going fast? Why Burkina Faso is getting more results? It's because they filled out all the levels, political commitment, the law, implementing the law, uh, implementation of the, the law at all levels in, uh, in, um, in the country, and also they are bringing the communities together and media and also religious leaders, so they mobilized all together. So they got more result and very fast. Egypt, all of these countries are members of IEC. If you take Egypt, we are working there uh, strongly, but because the medicalization, the officialization of the medicalization, this is you know pulling that uh, slow down our work. Gambia. Gambia, we have very strong uh, so civil society there who are working very well. They are getting some results, but the political will is very poor. Even the, at the highest level, the political responsible are against us there. So 
we can't get more results because of that situation. Guinea, my country, everybody is involved. Everybody, civil society, government, uh, lead, religious leaders, everybody. But why we are not, we are the second in the world getting the highest level, why? Simply because we have very small group of religious leaders who are just pulling everything back. So that situation must be to analyze. If you take Cote d'Ivoire, it's the concern in Cote d'Ivoire. Cote d'Ivoire is this religious leaders who is one of them is our president in Cote d'Ivoire, religious leader. He's giving a sermon and everything on Friday at the mosque talking against female genital mutilation. So this religious leader who is the president of IAC there pull up also the government, the law, and everybody. Um, Mali, Liberia, Liberia, for example, I want just to recall that IEC is the organization who proposed the February 6 to be International Day Zero Tolerance to FGM. We got it in 2003. We are celebrating, we are observing that uh, date every year. But if you go to Liberia, for example, while we are celebrating everywhere, in Liberia it's a national uh, holiday. Why? Because the president is elected woman. So that makes change. Mali. When we started to fight in Mali, we mobilized the government every day, and few, very few uh, fundamentalists was against us. And people were just laughing, saying, oh, it's the, the, you are you know, losing your time, and so. They lived things like that, and the fundamentalism came against the, all everything, and you know what happened to the Mali. It started against FGM. Sierra Leone. Sierra Leone, we have very good committee there, our committee, but we have also very strong uh, secret society, which is called uh, Bundo Society. This is the group of women who are very, very strong. They are, you know, have, even the president cannot be in front of them, face of them. So we have to analyze that situation. I will finish by uh, Mauritania. Mauritania is Islamic <laughs> Republic, but they voted there a fatwa against female genital mutilation. Due to this commitment of the religious leader, everything is moving uh, forward. Uganda, the president Museveni, he came with us, showed the flag of IEC, saying we have to fight against female genital mutilation, and that's also accelerated. So, just to finish, I want to say that the specific characteristic between different countries within a country clearly demonstrate that there is no a solution. Beyond this African diversity, we must stress the terrible phenomenon that exists within the African diaspora around the world, namely the fact that very often girls born in host country here, America and uh, another place in the world are brought back to the country of origin of their parents to be subjected to the female genital mutilation and child marriage also. Faced to this uh, serious thing, I see earlier created the affiliate around the world. We have, uh, I'm very happy to see the representative from USA here. We have very strong uh, IEC committee in uh, USA and we have political commitment and uh, we will take now the opportunity to meet her, to show to her. So uh, to just finish, we need the diaspora. And this phenomenon is in Africa mainly prevalent, but it's human, human right violation. So we are not honored. We started that fight 30 years ago, but we need the rest of the world. We need you to stop that very flagrant violation of the rights of women and children. And IEC is ready to continue to fight. Finally, we got the resolution. We went to the head of states in Africa. You know, we are the one who are criticizing our head of states. But we went to them, we said, we need a resolution against FGM. They automatically voted something, and you know now, we have that resolution. This is something also from the IEC, and I would like to take the opportunity to thank all of you and to say, the fight must continue. La lutte continue. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Thank you. So it's time for, for your questions. And I know that uh, Dr. Kalima, um, who's representing Kenya, the listening country, has to go on, is in great demand as a result of that, has to go on to the next session. So could we have the first question for Kenya? Oh, no shortage. So. Who's Kenya? Kenya? My name is Amina Mohammed. I'm the first lady of Somaliland. And I'm, first of all, I'm inspired by all the good work that's happening up towards FGM, especially in Britain as well. And in Somaliland, we don't have legislation as such, but we are working towards it. We have policies against FGM. The political will is there. One particular issue we always face the problem with is the practitioners, the people who do it, who do FGM, especially in the rural areas. These are, they are mainly women. They are women who are very poor. So when you are awareness raising, everybody else listens, but they are the people who don't listen. They are the people who keep on saying, it's our way of earning a living. What do you do uh, with people like that in Kenya? Moderator, do I answer? Yes. Thank you very much, uh, Your Excellency, the First Lady of Somaliland. In Kenya, we still had those challenges. And uh, civil society organizations, in their sensitization, faced the same. So we have examples of them being given some alternative to income generating activities. Now, in the government of Kenya, you have something called ways of fund, meaning enabling fund for women. And it targets women circumcisers who will down their tools uh, to avoid uh, being arrested and charged in court, and they do other income generating activities. We arrest them, we now have a law. And uh, the last one was a circumciser who despite the girl refusing, forcefully circumcised the girl, she has been jailed for seven years. So we have a law and people fear the law. It is indeed a deterrent. And so that is what we do. We give them the options, income generating activities. Government has set aside funds for that. Then we have other NGOs who want maybe to give them some money. We have uh, the county governments, for example, one in Western Kenya where the a circumciser while we were campaigning there, sensitizing communities, a lady who had been jailed for six months came out of the crowd and said she's now a crusader on prohibition of FGM, but she was earning an income from that. The governor of that county gave her money to go and start another job. Um, can you stay for one more question, Minister, before you go? One more question for Kenya. I'm going to speak in French. So, for again, for Kenya, you, uh, where, uh, where are you concerning the basic community? Because it's true that, that the um, circumcisers uh, do their job, but uh, the people who, what about the parents who take their children to the circumcising woman uh, and ask? Uh, it's the parents who, who demand that. Uh, uh, that um, that their child be uh, uh, subjected to female mutilation, and they give her money. So it's very important to fight that and to make the community understand the consequences. Because most of these communities have never uh, have never gone to school, and uh, so and we need to. It's no point in talking about social standards, but they need to understand what the modern Norman standards are. That anything that is harmful to children should not be practiced on their own children. So what do you do about that sort of community and the families in your country? Thank you very much. Uh, the government of Kenya still considers education as paramount. And we have in our structures, government structures, what you would call provincial administration or administrators for that matter. And we sensitize them on the prohibition of FGM law, and this is a copy you could have and see what we do. And the administrators in the locations 
are in charge of maybe almost 2,000 people. They sensitize, they sensitize those people about the dangers of FGM. The law does not spare such parents. We arrest you because you are aware of, of the law. Yes, we have danger sometimes it can go underground, but everybody is supposed to be a keeper uh, of the law. Our act says if you abate or you hear that there is something like uh, happening like that, the administrator is liable. If you allow your house for the action of female genital mutilation to be done in your house, in your homestead, you will be arrested. And so we have had cases, and thanks to the media that reports what is happening, we have charged people in court. Some are out on bail as such. Why? Because the government is serious about protecting the citizens of the country. We have a constitution. It is also embedded in our constitution that despite uh, culture or religion, no child should be subjected to a harmful cultural practice. The issues of early marriage, it is also in our constitution. And so it is the honors of each one of us in Kenya and especially the provincial administration whom we consider to be the enforcers of the laws. We hold them accountable. Thank you very much. And I think uh, you've got to go now because Jane, who's worked terribly hard to pull this session together, by the way, Jane from Defford. Ladies and gentlemen, Jane Miller. And uh, I understand the next minister that has to leave uh, is our very own Mr. Baker. So do we have a question for our British minister, madam? Hello, my name is Yasmin Khan, and I work for the HALO Project, which supports victims of HPV, FM, and FGM. And what I'd like to ask the panel, and I was very enthusiastic by the messages you gave, but my question to the panel is, especially to you, Mr. Baker, is given that it's a national action that we're asking for, how can you make sure that our small Tees Valley in the northeast of England actually has the theory put into practice, similarly to the um, Welsh government who has the framework which is rolled out nationally, what are the UK going to make going to ensure happen to make sure that the whole of the UK feeds into what's happened nationally? The first, the, so the first stage is getting uh, the lead from to the centre and joining everything up, as I mentioned before. Um, the second stage is to make sure that, there are the front, that, as I mentioned, the frontline professionals understand what um, the, the problem is and how they can help. And there is guidance going out to, to those people. There's guidance going out, <coughs> excuse me, for example, through the College of Policing to uh, the police forces up and down the country. Uh, there's guidance going out from the Director of Public Prosecution to the Prosecution Service. So we try to make sure that um, both the law and the government policy is understood more widely. But there is obviously a need to make sure that once we've got new laws, for example, mandatory reporting, that they're actually followed through. So there's a challenge for us now, and, uh, and we were on the case, as it were, to take forward this issue not just in terms of the law, but in terms of the implementation of the law, and then the monitoring of the law. And we'll be doing that as part of our work in the Home Office to make sure that those three things follow logically, including in the North East. Do you want to add to that? Or not? Is that okay? Yes. Thank you. Um, I want to congratulate all the panelists. And uh, I have a remark for Dr. Kuyati, uh, Mrs. Nesrin Sangari, Minister of Women Affairs of Burkina Faso. Um, for me, I, the session is uh, bringing all together, ending FGM through an e effective national action. And uh, you mentioned uh, that uh, you have best practice from country to country how countries are sharing those best practices. And also, um, we know that communities are separated by borders, but they are sharing the same values, traditional norms. Uh, 
Is it only an issue to have national action plans compared to have regional action plan because of the fact that the, you have the same communities with the same cultural background? What is effective in your experience and how we can use uh, the international uh, inter-African community experience to, to, to share or to as a best no, knowledge for what we are trying to do with this mo movement, which will be uh, created worldwide. Thank you. Before you answer, sorry, before you answer, sir, I know the question was directed at you, um, but um, the minister does have to leave. So did you want to make a quick comment before you go, uh, minister? Uh, well, just, just on that, I won't, I won't uh, answer the question in full, but to say that um, we've been, my colleagues at the Department for International Development have been working obviously with communities in Africa, and we, we find that the best way to make progress is to support the human rights in African countries. And then out of that, communities themselves recognize that FGM has to be dealt with, and then they tell their neighbors and other communities. And that's much more effective, I think, than, than governments, whether our government or an African government, telling people what to do, although I recognize the very good work in places like, like Kenya. As I do have to go, apparently, um, to my next meeting, can I just, on behalf of the British government, thank you very much for being here today and thank all our guests from, from other countries, from the US and from African countries. I think we've got a movement going here. We're making real progress. And I'm very grateful for all the work that's been done everywhere. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we, just to say that we've got chance for two more questions and then we'll have to wrap up. Did you Hi, um, my name is Priscilla Karim. I'm one of the survivors, and we actually been starting this campaigning since last year. But I wanted to ask, what provision can you guys provide for some of we, the campaigners? Because you, I heard that you guys are saying that to train doctors and other um, professionals to actually tackle the, um, this FGM thing. And you actually didn't mention anything about we, the campaigners who have been, who are like survivors, who have been campaigning to get this thing across. So, what provision do you guys have in store? I'll, I'll just answer that briefly and then pass on to my colleague from Wales. I wanted to start with you. I uh, think my sister came late. She's my sister, by the way. <laughs> so, she kind of missed that. I'll fill you in, sister. Everything has been very, very clear. So please, let's let the minister go, <laughs> okay. uh, because we haven't got time. Okay, let me just say, first of all, I'm sorry I didn't mention uh, those who have been subject to FGM. We do work with uh, those who have been uh, many, many great campaigners like Leila Hussein and so on. We do work with in the Home Office, and I've met them on a number of occasions, and we do try and test what we're doing with such women to make sure that we are fully in, engaged with what they think is going to work. So we do do that, and of course we'll talk to um, campaigners as we, as we go forward, but I was trying to answer the question about how we're rolling it out, but I absolutely it's important to make sure we work with um, those campaigners. Thank you for making the point. Just, thank you. Minister, did you want to add something yes, uh, there, so Janet? Yes, please, um, I just want to kind of reiterate, you're completely right, and I'm sorry for not mentioning this, I do have my little paragraph on supporting survivors, but supporting survivors is a core part of our aim in ending violence against women, domestic abuse, sexual violence, including FGM, early forced marriages. Um, in Wales, uh, we are doing this through a survivor care pathway for Wales, which is a multi-agency response aiming to provide the best possible support to survivors of FGM, honour-based violence and forced marriages. Its role is to promote effective joint working and to challenge the agencies, um, service providers and strategic partnerships to improve the support of victims of FGM, forced marriage and early child marriages. The Minister okay. is not here at the moment. The I think what the UK government has been very good at achieving, uh, because of the geography of Wales and because Wales is a bit smaller, we're, we're seeing ourselves as the pilot for the UK government. So if this pilot actually works in Wales, then of course the UK government will be taking this forward, I'm sure, and supporting survivors is always our aim when it comes to this. We cannot end this problem without your support, and thank you so much for all the hard work that you've been, has been doing. Okay, we've just got time for three more questions. The lady there, I'm coming to you next, and but this beautiful lady in pink. 
Hi, um, my question is, um, uh, it says we can all come together and end and, and FGM. Um, UK government is doing an amazing job and is highlighting the issue more than any other countries. Do you think the government should include FGM as a part of the curriculum for education? I come from mainly education, Sam. Do you think they should include it because they teach sex education? FGM should be part of that, should be included in that. Do you think that could be done? And do you think the government should, impl should, should implement that in part of the education for the girls if we are going to help end this? Should be part of it. I do you agree with that? I agree with you. And Welsh Government has took strides in making that through the Healthy Relationships Programme in schools. All our school leaders and officers in Wales are trained on these issues, so they are able to provide that support to their pupils. And also, having the national training framework in place, hopefully, by 2015, will ensure that all frontline practitioners, no matter what their level is, will be able to get that kind of education and that support from government in to make sure that we end this practice. Okay. Hi, my name is Fatu, uh, and I'm representing an organization in uh, Scotland, Edinburgh. Um, one of the things that I wanted to highlight is the fact that the Girls' Summit has not received a lot of coverage in Scotland. So most of the organizations that work to end FGM actually were not invited to this event. We had to basically be beg to come to this event. So I think if we are talking about a national action plan, we're talking about the whole, the UK as a whole, then it shouldn't just look at England and Wales. And another thing that we know most people who seek asylum are being sent to Scotland. And also a lot of Africans are moving from England and Wales to Scotland. Then if we do not include Scotland, then we'll be missing out a lot of, a lot of people. And just as uh, a couple of the speakers from Africa highlighted, in neighboring countries, for instance, I'm from the Gambia originally, and we know uh, rates of FGM have dropped significantly in Senegal, but we are seeing people are moving into the Gambia to, to take their children from Senegal to be caught, which is why, again, I'm highlighting the fact that it needs to be a cross-cutting thing. One more thing that we, have, we are concerned with is the fact that there is no clear structure in the UK for referral systems, so we, d we don't know for instance, if, if uh, there is a case of FGM, who do you refer it to? Does it go to the police? Do you call social service? There are no clear structures as to that, and this is something that I think should be taken into account as well. Thank I you very much. Did you want to respond to yeah, that? I completely agree with you uh, when it comes to Scottish government being involved. And as part of Welsh government, we work very closely with Scottish government um, in sharing that best practice um, and having those communication channels open between governments. Um, and I had to fight nail and teeth as well to make sure that I'm included in this. <laughs> Okay, I'd like to say to the panel, we are the converted in this room. We're all passionate about FGM. We know what we're, why we're here. We know we're already doing the work. We've been doing it for a long time. I get so many people who know I'm here saying, well, what difference will it make? It's a great summit. It's cost a lot of money. You're there, but what will happen? So I wonder how we can actually rally this amazing enthusiasm and act activity actually into measurable results that in 10 years' time, we can actually say we were there, we made it change. Um, because of time, can I ask each one of you maybe to just give me an uh, answer in one sentence um, to, to that question? How are we going to actually make action happen from all this talking? Sir. Yeah, before that, I would like just to reply. You know, uh, the minister uh, from Burkina asked if we need a regional program. Uh, I can say that this is the role, the main role of Inter-African Committee to bring all the 29 member countries together to have a same vision. Same this is objective. more than one sentence, Minister. And Sorry. Consensus. But it's important also to marry the generality and the uh, particularity. So we have, yes, big program for Africa for the, at interna international level, but we have to share the specificity, as I said, between uh, the countries. You are absolutely right. We have already that this is our role. Okay, thank you very much indeed. I'm sorry to be so strict, but I'm under pressure here. So Janet, how um, are we gonna make it happen? Well, 
everything that I've said today are things that we are already rolling out in the near future if we haven't already started it. So what I'm taking away today um, actually is a bit more work with men because I don't think a lot of that has been mentioned. So a commitment from me personally would be I would take away and make sure there's an action plan by where we are giving the communities responsibility as well in making sure that they're able to help us in this fight. Dr. Juba, what's your advice from Burkina Faso? How do we make things happen? Yes, thank you. Could I say, first of all, that uh, we must be aware of the fact that uh, most uh, participants have shown that there are dilemmas. We will have to use all of that to have recommendations first at uh, national level, and this can mean the drawing of an agenda nationally, but regionally and at world level. See, if we go in that direction, maybe we won't forget these suggestions that are made here so that they don't be remain uh, Dead letter. I think it's important to reinforce regional cooperation and from then move on from the world uh, to the world. Yeah, because if you work beautifully well within your borders, but across the border there is another policy, the whole thing could be one could cancel out the other. Secondly, we need to make mainstream the measures that are taken because you can't succeed unless you have streamlining. Mainstreaming, sorry. Uh, nobody can succeed without others, people. That is government, uh, civil society, all the uh, stakeholders. And, and stress one point. If we go too fast, uh, one must remember that these are uh, societal problems which are very old and, uh, and hard to solve from the, the Home Office, all the civil servants ganging up on me. So, <laughs> from the US at Embassy, um, Kathy, what's your advice? I, I Translating think, words to action. I'll be quick. I, I think from the US perspective, the most important thing is to, is to keep up the pressure, to keep the attention on this issue, and most importantly, to try as best as possible to keep telling stories and to remind people that this is about individual human beings, about young girls and women whose lives are radically changed. And I think if you keep that in mind, as, as hard as the statistics are to believe, it really is ultimately about individuals who are courageously talking about this. It makes a difference. Thank you very much indeed. And finally, Vittor, what's your advice um, to make things happen from the Portuguese perspective? Can I speak in Portuguese? Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, Please do. Uh, no. You'll need your headphones. Uh, no, we can't. Sorry. No. Could you say it just in one sentence? Uh, no contexto português, um, aquilo que é o nosso maior desafio neste momento uh, é conseguir efetivamente envolver as comunidades. Yes, our challenge, the major challenge in Portugal at the moment is to try and involve communities. Sobretudo para chegar aos líderes religiosos. And, and to get to the religious leaders. Nós conseguimos ter o apoio de, do imã da Mesquita de Lisboa. We have been getting support from the imã of the mosque in Lisbon. Mas temos a consciência de que para chegarmos às comunidades e aos bairros, onde as comunidades residem, teremos que mobilizar também os líderes religiosos locais, porque é com esses que há mais contato. We are also aware that we need to take this out to the smaller outreaching communities and to do that we realise that we must have more contact with religious leaders in those more